Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for your love for us. We ask that you would pour out your spirit of love upon us this morning, that we might truly understand your love, that we might extend it to those around us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week I introduced this uh, harvest series, which I've called Superfruits. Now, the idea is that these are things that uh, we develop in our lives as we grow spiritually. But I mentioned last week that really the Word of God is the seed that begins to produce these fruits in our lives. And so we have to be in the Word, or better yet, the Word has to be in us in order for these fruits to be produced. Now, the Bible talks over and over about us getting God's Word into us. Uh, We just heard from uh, Mike reading in Deuteronomy the command from God, and it seems like an odd command to, to place these things, and particularly, at least in Jewish practice, Uh, the verse about the Lord your God is one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, to to put that on your wrists and on your forehead, to, to put it on your doorposts. Now, the Jews actually took that very literally, and in fact, they created these things that were called, well, still are called, phylacteries that would were leather and they would tie on your wrists or on your forehead, and they would actually place that verse into a little leather pocket that was on their foreheads. Uh, and there, there are sects of Jews that still do that today. My brother, uh, who lives just outside of Boston, they bought their house from a Jewish family. And on the front door post, uh, on the molding next to the front door, there is a little brass plaque with that verse upon it. Now, it's so small that you can't read it unless you have a magnifying glass, but it's there. And my brother decided he would just leave it there. Now, the Jews could say by doing that that they were obeying the letter of the law. That's what God had said. Place it on your foreheads and on your wrists and on your doorposts. But the fact is that in this little leather pouch or on the doorpost, it, they couldn't really read it. it. It was there, but it wasn't really changing them in any particular way. In fact, I don't think that's what God had in mind at all. I think His point was that you are to keep the Word of God ever before you, keep meditating upon it. Now, we have… my my wife was memorizing some Scripture, and on our bathroom mirror we have some Scriptures on little index cards taped to the bathroom mirror. Now, that I think is closer because at least it's there and it reminds us of God's Word and some of God's promises. And that's more what God has in mind. But in in Revelation, John is told to eat this book. In fact, Eugene Peterson wrote, wrote a whole book based on that verse, eat this book. The idea being not that he was to literally just eat it, but he's to internalize it, to take it in, to make it a part of who he is. And that's what we're called to do, to to really get to know God's Word, to make it a part of who we are, that these fruit might be produced in us. And the first fruit, the first super fruit in terms of this series, is love. Now, there's a problem with that. And the problem is that I don't think we, especially perhaps in our culture, really even know what that word means. I mean, for one thing, and I mentioned this in Sunday school this morning, we only have the one word, love. And the, re- the, the, the outflow of that is that we love a whole lot of things, and it, and it puts our family and our spouses in the same category as as pizza and our favorite pair of shoes and our car, 
We love them all. But do we really feel the same way about all of those things? Does that word really describe the same emotions and the same attachment that we have to each of those? Well, perhaps some of you, maybe it does, but we only have the one word, and that limits our understanding of that word. Now, in Greek, the, the language that the New Testament was originally written in, they have several words for love. Some that you might be familiar with, phileo, which is the uh, brotherly love, where we get Philadelphia, the, the city of brotherly love. We have eros, which is the more sensual or romantic love. And then the one that the Bible uses most often is agape, and that is a more selfless love. And we'll see in our passage for today uh, how that is different. But before we go there, I'd just like to remind you where we come up with these uh, fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul sets up a c comparison and contrast. He lays out those things, those characteristics, those behaviors that the world engages in. The, the behaviors of the flesh, he calls them. And he talks about things like uh, fornication and impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and all other things like these. Now, for most of us, those are familiar. I mean, whether we enjoy them or not, they are part of our world, and we see them going on all the time. It, they are really the way that the world operates. But Paul says, now the works of the flesh are obvious, but I am warning you, as I warned those before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom. And then in verse 22, he says, by contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gender, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And we'll be looking at all of those. But what he's saying there is, these are the things, these are the fruits that we as Christians, we as followers of God, these are the things that should be produced in our lives, that we might look different than the rest of the world. Not, not so that we can uh, be above or better than the rest of the world, but because they will be attractive to the rest of the world. Because we will stand out and people will, will say, well, we would like some of what they have. And the first one is love. And Paul, again, in Corinthians describes this love. He begins by saying, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing." If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, now think about those things that he mentions. They're all good things, and, and in some cases you might even say heroic things. But he says that even if I do these great things, these things that we, we ought to aspire to do, even if I do them, if I don't do them, in love, then they're worthless. So love is the key, but what, what is this love? What, what, what does this love look like? Well, he goes on to tell us. Love, this, this sort of love, this agape love, is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Now, think about some of those things. 
The, the difference in that kind of love compared to what we generally think of as love. In fact, I think in our culture today, love is most often equated with sex. That, that's what this culture thinks of as love. But that's not what Paul describes here. This, this biblical love is, is not about me. It, it's not about what I want or what I need or, or getting my way. This type of love is completely other-focused. It, it's completely focused on, on the object of love, which is not even specifically defined. It, this is the kind of love that we should have for each other. Unfortunately, we often save this passage for weddings, which is very nice, and certainly I would hope, I mean, it would be, it'd be really nice if we could actually experience and, and share this sort of love in marriage. I don't think that even happens all that often. But it's not talking about marital love. Paul, Paul is not addressing marital love here. He, he is talking to Christians. This is this is how we ought to treat each other. This is how we ought to treat other people in the world, not just our spouses. Now, our spouses, that might be a good place to start, but it shouldn't be the place to end. And I, I'm struck by this, the last part I read, it, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. I think that goes completely counter to our current culture. Our, our current culture is to rejoice with people in their wrong, to do whatever you want. It's, it's okay. What, whatever works for you, that, that's fine, and we celebrate that, and we rejoice with you in that. And this says we shouldn't rejoice in wrongdoing, but we should rejoice in the truth. Now, that's different than judging. It doesn't mean that we should judge other people because we're really no better than they are. I mean, we might be trying, but we're all sinners. But we don't rejoice in wrongdoing. We don't encourage people in their wrongdoing. We rejoice in the truth. We rejoice in the fact that there is a, another way. There, there's a better way. There's a better way to treat each other. There's a better way to live. And then in verse 7, he goes on. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, those words bears, believes, hopes, endures. Those aren't always just warm and fuzzy, easy feelings. Love puts up with a lot. I mean, that he ends with love endures all things. Endure is not something we really want to aspire to. Well, I endured the pastor's sermon this morning. But it says love does all of these things. It's not worried about my experience. It's not worried about what I need or what I want or, or what will entertain and keep me happy. Love is about bearing with others. And if you've been in a church very long, you know that there are times when we have to bear and endure each other. But that's what we're called to do. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, 
even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, and the greatest of these, is love. Now, why is love the greatest of these? Well, one, it's how we maintain positive, healthy relationships with each other and with God. But also, if you read the, the rest of that passage, everything that we experience in this life is temporary. We don't, we don't understand God's love fully. We don't understand His plan fully. And so we use words like faith and hope because we're believing in something we don't completely understand. We, we can't quite grasp. We don't understand the fullness of it. And we hope. We hope because we don't have yet. You don't hope for something that you already have possession of. You hope for that which hasn't yet occurred. But when the truth comes, when we are face to face with our Creator, when we are in God's very presence, then we'll know fully. Then we will understand fully. Then there will be no need for hope and faith because we will have it all. But even then, there will still be love. So even when we no longer have need of faith, we no longer have need of hope because we are right there in the presence of Jesus Himself, faith and hope will fall away. But love will remain. Love. I almost considered doing the fruits of the Spirit backwards because it just seemed as though love is where we should end. Because in a way, it is, it is the greatest. It is, it is the most important. It is the foundation. But that's what I came to realize. It is the foundation. We, we don't really go any further if we don't start with love. Love, love is the fertile soil in which the seed of God's Word germinates and produces all the other fruits. Love. If, if we can't learn to love one another, even those of us gathered here in this room today, then what chance do we have of spreading that love outside of these walls? God's love is something that is, is stirred in us. It's something that is produced in us by God's Holy Spirit, but it comes from our knowledge and our understanding and our time spent with God in His Word. God loves us. That's why He gave us His Word. He loves us truly and desperately and deeply, and He wants to, us to know and to understand how much He loves us, that we might be so filled with His love that it might be spilling out, that we can't even encounter another human being without love just pouring out of us. But that love is produced as we begin to understand through God's Word His love for us. So let us commit ourselves to loving God, to learning of His love for us, that we might love one another, that we might love all those who God puts in our path, that we might love them into God's family.
In Jesus' name, amen.